I'll keep my phone up to see if there's comments or questions. Okay, great. And make sure it's uh make sure it's connecting to my double uh to my double yeah. check. Let's see. All right, oh, it looks like it worked. I love it when it works on the first try. Hey there, Time Out for Moms. I'm Sarah Curry. Right. I'm joined today with Jennifer Campbell. I mean, all things motherhood, really. I mean, we met because you're doula in Reno, and we talked about trouble that I had with um, breastfeeding, and you lead a whole coalition out there on breastfeeding mothers out in Nevada, which is amazing. You have more years experience being a mom than a lot of us in this group. Jennifer, welcome. Tell us about yourself, how you got into what you're doing now, and of course, about your family too. I mean, that's a lot. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I have 32 plus years in the trenches as a mom. My oldest biological daughter turned 32 April, the beginning of April, 2024. So I know this is live right now, but just in mm -hmm. case people watch it. So yes, I have 32 plus years in the trenches. We have 18 kids. I have, to make it super simple, I was pregnant seven times, but I gave birth four. I adopted six. I had two kids age out or stay long-term in foster care, a foreign exchange student, five step kids. That's, I mean, and that's making it simple. <laughs> that's really simplifying it. Yes. I have 15 years in foster care. And um, so there were kids that came and went for sure. But I, I really, when I did foster care, I really wanted the kids that didn't have to find another home after mine. Mm -hmm. um, and that worked sometimes and not worked sometimes. I mean, you know, my, my, I always, I said prior to today's the first day I've said that I have six adopted kids because I have a daughter who turns 36 in May, 2024. It would have been about a week. Her birthday is a week before I would have graduated high school and I graduated at 17. So I would have been, yeah, I would have given birth to her had I biologically had her the, the, a week before I graduated from high school in 1988. And she turns 36. She came to me when she was nine. She was a long-term foster child, kind of bounced around with reunification and she's talked for years 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 like would, would you adopt me and I always said yes like I have no hesitation adopting you I don't love you differently I don't feel differently about you if you want that piece of paper and you want your birth certificate changed so she just um, then I'll do it and she just submitted the paperwork to be adopted so oh, wow what a story. I love yep. what you do. I taught for a long time in New York city and always said once I was at a stage of life that I would foster. Cause I got, I got to teach so many of those kids that were yeah. I mean, in and out of homes and bounced around and kicked out and ran away and like all of the things. And I got to, I get to reach them in a different capacity as like a teacher and a coach more so yep. on the coaching side of anything. And so I love your story. I love how many families you've helped and how many lives you've changed because of it. I went through infertility to get pregnant and I had my oldest daughter at 21. I wasn't, I was married. It's crazy looking at my adult kids that are that age. Like why did everybody around me think this was like such a great idea, but I didn't start infertility because I was desperate to get pregnant. I started mm -hmm. because I was having so many issues with my cycles. Um, just that was a mess. That whole thing was a mess from the very beginning. And, mm -hmm. you know, they do the same surgeries, but in that process, in that 10 months of being maxed out on Clomid and Provera and doing seven day surgeries, I, I really had a strong desire to have kids. And the mm -hmm. infertility specialist looked at me and said, like, you're your most fertile right now. So, you know, the goal shifted from like figuring out what's wrong to holy cow, am I going to be able to have kids? And he actually, I got to IVF and I said, that's not my path. I just knew 20 years old. And I was like, white, white flag in this one. That is not my path. And so kudos to the mamas who take infertility further, because that was not in my, that I just knew, I just knew with all of me that that wasn't my path. And so he was weaning me off the medication and, you know, they're taking your blood all the time. And in there, he, he was this little Asian man short, like I'm five, nine. So he was short to me and he walked into the room and he hugged me, which was very unusual. And he said, this is your miracle from God. You are pregnant. You're not pregnant on the cycle we put you on. 
I don't know how it happened. I don't know if it will ever happen again. You have a very high rate of miscarriage because of your hormone levels naturally. And mm -hmm. you, so just know that you have a high rate of miscarriage and that this will probably be a very challenging pregnancy because of that. And it mm -hmm. was, it was a very challenging pregnancy. Um, you asked what I do and I'm a doula and a lactation educator, childbirth educator. And when my first daughter was born, uh, 32 years ago, I was with a midwife in a birth center, wanted to do the whole natural thing. Uh, my ex-husband now, my now ex-husband was military and he wasn't there. So I was 21. I was alone. Well, I mean, I was with my mom and my 18 year old sister, um, which not always the best support. You know, when we go into labor delivery, a lot of women are like, oh, I want my husband there. He's the best. And he is, but he doesn't know birth work. So you're putting a lot of pressure on this man that you love to make, make it so that you have the birth that you want when he has no idea what he's doing. You've never done it before. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I was that mom, I was pregnant and I was pretty much by myself. And my midwife looked at me at 37 weeks and said, you can transfer to this hospital or this hospital, something's not right. And you need to, you need to transfer today. And I was so sad crushed really because I wanted this birth center pool the whole situation like the candles the midwife I loved her but it showed me one intuition which is not my primary personally it's not my primary go-to mm -hmm. um I'm very logic and visual driven and mm -hmm. um I went to I was in New England where my mom lived and I went to Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and Many doulas go into their first labor and delivery and it doesn't go well and they're traumatized to some degree or they realize retrospectively that like informed consent doesn't really mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean they're going to tell you everything before you make a decision and you feel kind of pushed into things. And because of the trauma from that delivery, they want to help women so other women don't feel trauma. And I had the opposite issue. It didn't go perfectly the way I wanted it. I had my daughter 19, 19 hours later. I had such amazing medical professionals. And that doesn't mean that they didn't push me. I got a shot of morphine. They finally convinced me to get an epidural. And the anesthesiologist came in. He gave me the shot in my back. And then he said, she's pushing. So the only reason I didn't get the epidural is because I held out long enough Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful I had a natural delivery, you know, but like I felt that pressure. So it's not like it went perfectly or beautifully yeah. or like I really wanted it to, but overwhelmingly it was positive. They told me that they would evaluate my daughter at the bedside. And if they, that we knew there was something wrong, but we didn't know what, and mm -hmm. that they, if they were going to save her life, they would leave the room after the bedside evaluation. But if they felt like they couldn't, they would hand her back to me to die in my arms. And this was my preparation to give birth the first time by myself. So she was born God. and they did the bedside evaluation. You could see that she was really struggling to breathe and they left and I heard nothing for nine hours. And then the head neonatologist came into my room and said, Brianna is the most critical baby out of 29. If we had known how sick she was, we would have handed her back to you and allowed her to die. She will not live through her first 72 hours. And the first time you'll hold your daughter will be after she's passed away. You can't touch her in NICU. And she was four pounds, four ounces. I was 37 weeks. Whatever was happening, it just wasn't, it was a very tough pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, and I was released after 24 hours, but I wasn't going to the Ronald McDonald house because there's no way I'm leaving that hospital until I've held my daughter after she's died. So I was sleeping like in waiting rooms and hallways and a nurse found me at day three and brought me to the nurse's lounge and had me shower and then brought me to the pump room, which I've been using. But like, if you've never seen a pump, ladies, like, yeah, you hook it up. It's like, I don't know what I'm doing it, but I, I was engorged. I oh, was, how can I can relate to that situation? Right. First, first time. You like. It is definitely a foreign object. So she sat me down in the pump room. The lactation consultant sat down. She fit me, did the flange fitting, got me all set up, turned the pump on, sh sh taught me, taught me how to use this yeah. pump. And then she leaned over to me and put her hand on my leg. And she said, tell me about your birth. And nobody had asked me how I was for three days. 
And I sobbed for 20 minutes. Like I'm, I'm hiding in the hospital. They kicked me out of NICU to go sleep and go home. And, you know, I'm hiding in the hospital because I don't want to leave because my daughter's going to die and I want to be there. And, um, no one's asked me how I was. So 20 minutes later, she turned the pump off and I filled up the bags and I didn't feel as engorged anymore. And she showed me how to wrap it up and she gave me a hug. And that night my daughter turned the corner. She's 32. I spoil her. I try to spoil alert that story first so that people aren't traumatized still, by my story. It's still incredibly emotional to hear. Cause I can't, I can't even imagine my daughter was whisked out of the room, completely blue when she was born. So that feeling of like, it's what is going to happen but for not for you not to know anything for nine hours. Mm-hmm. I can't even, I can't even imagine. It was awful. It was awful. I had my first bladder infection ever. I just gave him birth and it was like, I had no stitches. It was a natural vaginal delivery. Everything went really beautifully in my labor and delivery. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just had a baby. Like my body is not. <laughs> Yeah. And even if it goes as best case scenario, like you still just right. birth a human. Right. So I knew in that moment, in that time period, I'm going to help women the way I felt like it was such a po- overwhelmingly positive experience. Um, and overwhelmingly positive experiences don't mean you always get what you want. Everything goes your way. There were no hiccups. It means it was an overwhelmingly positive experience, despite the fact that it wasn't perfect and didn't quite go your way. And I became a breastfeeding counselor a year when my daughter was, by the time she was a year old, I was a breastfeeding counselor. I did birth work for 12 years. So I was a IBCLC lactation consultant. And I spent seven years um, as a birth assistant working in a midwifery practice. We lived in Alaska at that point. Um, I didn't think I would get pregnant. And I didn't want to pick up where I left off with infertility and Mm -hmm. I was the kid that should have been in foster care and my third grade teacher made a difference to me so it was just really natural like I don't know if I can get pregnant again I'm not going to do anything except for not use birth control Mm -hmm. and which was the decision that we made like let's just not use birth control and if you get pregnant we'll see I had to make the decision early on that I would be I would be okay with the fact that I had a very high chance of miscarrying. So pregnant seven times gave birth four of those three miscarriages. I lost four babies. So my final pregnancy, I lost twins at 16 weeks. And, um, that resulted in a DNC and a hysterectomy at 33. Like my, my biological journey was a little messy. And Mm -hmm. in the end, when I had the hysterectomy, And then I had internal bleeding. So they had to do a life-saving surgery. They cut me hip to hip, took everything out. I was dead on the table. I had five blood transfusions. I mean, it was very traumatic surgeries, those three surgeries. Mm -hmm. Um, And he told me, I don't know how you carry to term. I don't know what this guy saw. I wasn't in there, obviously. But Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what he saw to make him feel that way. But basically, from the time I started my journey considering children. I mean, I was 15 when I went to the OB and I hadn't gotten a period yet. I was right before my 16th birthday. And the doctor, when I was 15 years old said, you may have trouble getting pregnant and you, you will probably go through infertility. And again, like what do people see when they share this information with us? But I, and I don't know, except to that it was a drop in a bucket for me that sent me on a trajectory. I don't need to give birth to babies in order to have a family. Mm -hmm. Um, My third grade teacher made a difference to me. I should have been in foster care. There are all these other kids like it Mm -hmm. from 15 all the way through this experience. It just sent me in a direction that I was going to do foster care. I was going to adopt. So, you know, (laughs) we have a very open joking, open about adoption and self joking relationship. And my kids don't think about who's adopted and who wasn't, and they're not treated differently. But, you know, one time my daughter's like, oh, I don't like pineapple. And, and another daughter's like, how do you not like pineapple? Are you adopted or something? And she's like, yeah, actually I am adopted. I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. No, yeah. You know, like we really have fun with it. And, um, one of my girls that's adopted, she's like, mom chose me special. She didn't know what you were like a genetic crapshoot. She didn't know what she was getting with you. And so <laughs> it's been, it's been really, really fun. And then, you know, I was divorced 20 years ago and Dane and I have been together for 10. And so we're a blended family and that's the hardest thing I've ever done. 
Um, I, we still talk and I'm like, I don't know how we, we did a really great job. I mean, we have hindsight now, right? Almost all of our kids are adults. I'm down to one at home. That's 14. And there's mm -hmm. an eight year gap between her and the next one. Okay. Um, Dane, Dane had four children and his wife died. So uh, my 14 year old, her mom died when she was a baby and I'm all she knows. Um, so we have a lot of, we have kids that have had a lot of trauma. They've come from a lot of different backgrounds and um, we've done a really good job. Trust me, I would go back. I'm like, oh, if I could go back and leave myself notes at these specific times, like to do it a little differently, you know, to mm -hmm. switch gears just a little bit. I, of course, because you're human moms, we feel like we're failing every single day, uh, every single day. <laughs> and retrospectively, I know that, you know, I did a really good job mm -hmm. and um, there's not tons and tons of stuff I would go back and change. Mm -hmm. So those are all good things. But definitely I, my first birth got me into the birth work field just mm -hmm. for the opposite reason that most women get into birth work. I wanted yeah. to I wanted women to feel supported in a positive experience. Mm -hmm. And I had the next three at home. I had two water births. I, you know, I was in a home mm -hmm. birth midwifery practice. So I got to do all that. And then when I was divorced, I had to give it up because I needed set, you know, I had eight kids at home, 12 and under. I kept doing foster care when I was single. So I took on a sibling group of four and, <laughs> Um, I was, I had to work up to four jobs. Sometimes it was a really rough couple of years. I gave up what I love because I needed set hours and set pay yeah. and birth work is not set hours and set pay. And then quite, quite the opposite, <laughs> quite the opposite. Am I, you know, I'm blessed with an amazing husband who basically had this wonderful conversation about three years ago. And the end result of this conversation was you're the happiest person that I know, but you do nothing that fulfills you. And it's time for you that. to write. That's a, that's a nugget of knowledge right there. <laughs> yeah. I, I was happy. I mean, you know, I was running my own business. Um, I mm -hmm. was happy. It was a successful business by that point. And I mean, it was successful out of the gate and, um, I walked away from it to go back to birth work because this is where my passion lies. So I had, what a blessing that not only did I did something that I love for so long mm -hmm. and it was devastating to give it up, I got to come back and do it again in a very, very different way because things have changed. Time has changed. I've changed, you know, most of my kids are adults. So that's a lot of information on the backstory. I like the. I think the backstory is so important though, because it takes you to like where, where you were where, through what we, where you were. And I'd love to hear you talk about the balance. Cause I'm here sitting okay. as a mom at 44 with a five and seven year old mm -hmm. at times completely overwhelmed running my own business. Yeah. I'm about to have my two kids home, my two kids home. That's it. Two, <laughs> two more. Sometimes like, like a bonus, like few neighbors in the house or my nieces and things like that. Mm -hmm. But talk about the balance and how, probably more so the mental part of it all, yeah. of how did you, especially in those single days, like before you got oh. remarried, of how did you balance it all? And what is your advice to people? Because I don't even know if I apply in this situation to being overwhelmed or busy. <laughs> I, as a single mom, one thing that I did was, you know, I had had that hysterectomy and mm -hmm. I, I got, I came out of that feeling like I was less than a woman. Um, a lot. yeah, uh, it saved my life. And it wasn't that I wanted to have more kids. It's that I didn't have the choice. The choice was removed and it was very traumatic. So I signed up with a gym and here's the thing. I was working up to four jobs. My oldest daughter was 12. She was a consummate babysitter. Brie, you know, she's 32 now, but Brie mm -hmm. was like the best. All my kids are CPR certified. They, you know, they lived, they lived this foster care life and babysitting and helping. So she, here's one of my regrets. She took on too much in this transition. My ex-husband, it wasn't just a divorce. He went to prison mm -hmm. that I was, I hadn't, worked a traditional job in over a decade. I was a stay at home mom while I did this lactation and birth work. And so I homeschooled my kids. I had a real, a life that I really, really, really loved that was mm -hmm. very disrupted. So we moved from Alaska to Reno in that move. We found out he was going to prison and, mm -hmm. um, we got divorced and 
you know, it was a two year process. It wasn't like this all happened and it was done. It was a two year process. The whole prison and the whole thing was. Um, so I was very alone in a place that I had no, no one. I knew no one. Um, I had just lost these twins and were pretty much told to walk it off. And I, it was, I was at my lowest low of my adult life. Why Reno? Um, Why did you move to Reno? We had family in Utah, Wyoming, and Arizona, and we didn't really want to live in any of those places, but we wanted to be about a 12 hour drive living in Alaska. It was my, the hardest and my favorite place I've ever lived. Mm -hmm. And we were so far away from family. I grew up not spending a lot of time with family and a lot of it was dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. My ex-husband had a really amazing family. My mom and my sister were in Arizona. His family was in Wyoming and Utah. I'm like, our kids are being raised and they hardly know their family. And we've got great family. Like, I feel like it, that's such a disservice to them. And that was really why we moved. It was me okay. pushing the fact that, you know, our kids should grow up with family and they did. And I'm very glad I like that happened and they had very close relationships with family. And I'm, I'm very glad. So we chose Reno because it was within a 12 hour drive. We had, we had like 23 places on the, you know, you look at different places that you want to live and you get the information from chamber of commerce and, mm -hmm. you know, you're whittling it down and we got it down to two and then flew to both of them and chose Reno. There was like, it was really that was the decision. It wasn't anything exciting. <laughs> um, it's like having a black eye and it's not from the bar fight, you know, it's cause you tripped and hit your face. It's, it's not a good story. There's nothing <laughs> exciting about it. So we chose here, we moved here, he went to prison and I decided to do foster care um, a mm -hmm. after a while. It's that probably added more stress. The catalyst behind that was that I was one of my jobs. I was working at the school my kids went to. So I gave up I gave up. I'm thumbs upping myself. Uh, I gave, I gave, <laughs> um, I worked at the school that a lot of my kids were going to because it put me on a similar schedule and I was there. I had a son that was autistic in kindergarten and um, I met a single dad there and his daughter and we dated, we ended up, ha eventually we had a relationship, but um, it was, I ended up taking in his daughter's mom's kids just doing yeah. the, doing I, the connections over you here can't, you can't it's not a connection and so it was a very specific placement because I had had nine years experience at that time during foster care and I lived here and I could accommodate them and it mm -hmm. was one of those know somebody that knows somebody that then referred to me okay. um so grateful. I'm so grateful. But I think one of the things that I did was I hired a trainer. I got a gym membership and I hired a trainer because I was post hysterectomy. Yeah. Um, the hysterectomy between that pregnancy and the hysterectomy, I'd gained 35 pounds more than I'd gained in a pregnancy. And mm -hmm. I just didn't feel like myself anymore. I, I needed to figure out who I was again, outside of my kids. And through getting this divorce and that the trainer actually convinced me to do fitness competitions, which I did. And it was, um, this is how my brain works. You're here. You need to be here by this date. And this is how we're going to, you know, reverse engineer this process. So you get there by this. I'm, my brain's like, yes, I love that. Um, and I did them. And at my first one, it was, I just had no clue, right? It was like my first bird. It's like, yeah, don't hire anybody to help you. Don't know what you're doing. Just show up and wing it. Um, kind of did that. And a trainer in the audience came up to me and he said, I know your diet's off. I know you probably don't feel that great. Your trainer's not giving you great advice. And um, if you want to switch to me, and I did, and I did a few more uh, mm -hmm. fitness competitions. And then I kind of realized like, I'm in this place. I was in magazines. I was in a couple of fitness magazines and um, it was like, it was great experience. It was really fun. But I, even with all the chaos going on, a divorce, a husband in prison, you know, I, I wasn't dating and didn't, hadn't done foster care yet at this point, eight kids, 12 and under at home, working up to four jobs. I still put myself first. I still got the gym membership. I still got the trainer. The fact that it went a little off of what I was planning. I mean, it was a great goal. It was a great goal to get me where I wanted to be. And 
it was a process that helped me get through losing three babies, twins at 16 weeks, especially. Mm -hmm. It got me through the divorce. It got me through single parenting and going back to work. Um, I never got my bachelor's degree, which was a huge problem that I never saw coming because Mm -hmm. it limited the jobs that I could do. You know, being a stay at home mom for over a decade and doing all this birth work, it's like, it's an amazing thing, right? But it doesn't look great on a resume to a corporation necessarily. Yeah. So I really had to, you know, drag myself up through and into management at jobs, um, whittle it down. I got certified as a hairdresser. So I also went to school and Mm -hmm. I did it in nine months and I, I knocked that out so I could have that as a job and an income, which I did for several years. So, you know, I was trying to use every resource that I had that could support me and the kids And I was also trying to better myself to get to like the next level of income. Um, And I was pulling myself up from my bootstraps. And then, you know, I was a really good admin. I was just really good at it. I don't love it, but I'm really good at it. This was the whole conversation about like, you're the happiest person I know, but you don't do anything that fulfills you. And I was so good at it that I got a job. One of the jobs that I had was working from home. This was mm-hmm. way before COVID, like six years before COVID. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, everything I've done at every office that I've worked, everywhere, except for cutting hair, every every place that I've worked, I could do almost all of it at home. So I, I accidentally started my own VA business where I would work at admin oh. and I crushed <laughs> it. I did great. It was like, I never had a website. I never had to really put information out. People found me. I got referrals from one place when I was done to another, like you've got to hire her. She'll get everything organized. And, Mm -hmm. um, it it was great. So, I mean, my career sort of evolved on this twisty turny path. Um, and I loved, I hated some of what I did. I loved some of what I did. I accidentally started a pretty successful VA business that I walked away from. I didn't even bat an eye when my husband was like, we'll go to one income and you can go back to birth work. I was like, done, quit, done. Mm -hmm. Totally. Like it never existed. Like that VA business never existed. Um, yeah, I just, I used every resource that I could. And I, found the time to put myself first. I'm in a running group called 520 because they meet at 520 in the morning. They meet at 520 in the morning because it's a bunch of soccer moms who want to go running and get exercise in and have like that's the only window of time, you know, when their kids are getting up and getting ready or right before they get up, you know, and that's what I did. I went really early in the morning. Um I worked in and around jobs and kids schedules. Side note, my daughter Bree we moved here when she was 12 and I homeschooled, but then they had this amazing charter school in up in Alaska and she went into seventh grade here and right away her counselor, somebody was like, we need to do some testing on her. And I was like, okay. And she was already tested out of high school. She was tested into college level classes. And they literally, they looked at me and said, and this is 20 years ago, but they said, we don't really know what to do with her because she's so far ahead academically And so the decision was made that she would go to junior high school for science and math and electives she went to school for. But I took her to the community college for history and English. And I would sit outside the professor's door so that she could take classes as a 12 year old at the college. So she was, she graduated with like 48 college credits or something ridiculous. Um, yeah, she's a financial advisor. She's amazing. Way more logical than I am, but, um, you know, you're trying to balance like what your kids need and your income. Those are, I think are the two biggest, where do your kids need to be and what do they need to do and what do they need and how can you feed them? And what, you know, how can you do that and do it as well as possible? And then how can you make enough money to support everybody? Yeah. Um, I think those are the two biggest stressors. And so you have to balance that, that your work and you're making money and your kids and what you can and can't do. I mean, my daughter will always remember the one concert I didn't attend. She won't remember the 30 that I did go to, but she will definitely remember the one that I missed. Mm. Not thinking about the fact, like when she was upset in high school and even college, like 
pre having her own children, like, um, yes, I went to every single concert except for one. Mm-hmm. And it was because I was working. So like, how do you like those jeans? Cause that, you know, yeah. um, mm-hmm. and, and making sure you're carving out time for yourself and that, that time for myself to go to the gym and to go running and to exercise, you know, over time, my kids would be like, mom, do you want to go for a run? And I know I wasn't being a terrible mom, but I also know they got the best version of me after I was out for 30 minutes. So they'd ride their bikes with me, take me on their bus route, you know, let's just do a quick, like 30 minutes, get outside. And they'd all jump on their bikes and ride their bikes with me. And then they would start running with me when they got a little older. Um, and they, they knew I went to the gym. They went to the fitness competitions. They learned how to run an aid station at a 5k or a half marathon. So my kids would run an entire aid station and I, you know, there was one race after I remarried, there was one race where my son looked at Dane, looked at my husband and he said, something's wrong. She should already be here. And there was nothing wrong, but he knew my time so well. My kids knew my time so well that he knew I was a little behind. So I think involving your kids in whatever brings you passion, it doesn't have to be running or the gym, but finding something and do it because you want to be the best version that you can for them. And there's no way to do that. There's no way to do that if you're not doing something for yourself. And I think physical activity is the best because it hits so many of our brain chemistry, right? I, I mean, that all the time okay. that it's like, people are like, how do you get up at five o'clock and work out? Aren't you tired? I'm like, I do it for my mental health. I yeah. mean, yeah, the physical benefits are fantastic. I can keep up with my kids. I can do all the things I do physically, but the mental piece for me is yep. always more important, but I am a, such a better mom, a better spouse, a better community member, a better yeah. everything if I get up and take care of my mental health in the morning. And I love, there's two things that you said, obviously putting your fitness on the priority list, which a lot of us do not. A lot of us do not put our wellness anywhere near the priority list when you have a, when you're a mom and you have a family. But the other thing was you just like made it happen. Like you didn't know your end goal of like when you were single and when you were doing, but you like went to hairdresser school and you started doing that. And then you started doing VA work and you made it happen. I think it's very underestimated the ability of women and moms in particular to just figure it out. Like you don't need to know what the end is going to be all the time, (laughs) like one step at a time. And whether it's in business or it's in motherhood, we're just constantly taking like one step at a time to move in the right direction, not only for yourself, but obviously for your family, which was a huge, I mean, responsibility is not even the word to support that many people when you have eight kids under 12. But you just kept moving forward. And yes, I'm sure you had a lot of steps back and a lot of down, like down slides down a hill, but you just kept moving forward and you kept putting your own wellness on the map. And I'm sure your kids all see it and probably do it for themselves now because they had a mom that took care of them, took care of herself, which is not always the case. We don't all have role models that are like you that are taking care of your own physical, mental, and emotional wellness. We don't. And I didn't. And I think that was a huge thing. I knew I had two parents who were addicts and food was one of the addictions and I depression and, you know, my dad was the angriest, meanest person. So I knew I didn't want to become that. And I also know doing better, like being a step above where, how I grew up wasn't hard. It wasn't setting the bar very high. I didn't know what it looked like. Like, I know I'm going to do a better job, but I want to do a much better job. And a lot of that came down to like figuring out how to eat healthy and figuring out how to exercise and the mental, emotional, the whole thing. So I, I mean, I knew that I had to do something for myself in all of that. I think women, all women out there struggling know that that's an answer, that if they actually there's this word selfish that's gotten a really bad rap. Like you're this horrible person. And I think there's a level of being selfish that absolutely is that if you're only thinking about yourself, but taking time for yourself to be healthy physically and mentally, um, even if it's a little extra food prep time, even if it's whatever, taking a couple hours on Sunday to meal prep for the week, which I did for, I still do. I like I've done for years and years and years and years to make my week easier. Mm -hmm. right? 
when did that become selfish and when did selfish become a bad thing? Like how, how, how we're equating this. And then we have like the guilt, the shame and the feelings of failure as moms, as women, as wives, as everything. Um, and m myself included. And in that, in the lowest point, I was like, nope, this is not the path that I'm going to go down mm -hmm. this. I'm unhappy. I feel shame. I feel failure is not the path that I'm going to go down. That's looking a little bit too close to how I was raised. Mm -hmm. Um, even if you remove the abuse out of that, you know, I, it still was too close. I did not want that mentality in my life. And I knew I had the choice. It was my choice, how I showed up every single day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I gave 150% every day to my kids. Sometimes that looked like I was knocking out of the park. And sometimes that looked like a fraction because stuff happens, right? Mm -hmm life happens. I am a strong believer in ever you're doing the best you can with what you have in that moment. In that moment, if you really are, and if you really are trying to do the best you can at that moment, at whatever capacity you're at, we get sick, we have stress, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, I mean, then you're doing great, but you have to put yourself first. And there's a whole, like, put your mask on before someone else's and fill your cup. And but they're mm -hmm. true. I mean, I think they're overused. Self-care yeah. is another overused thing, right? We have all these things that have just been so minimized by their overuse and potential negative connotations that it seems like we're selfish, horrible moms who are only thinking about what we want because we're going for a 30 minute run. And that's such a load of crap that mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no place for that in my, in my head and in my heart. You have to okay. put yourself first. Well, that's why I say like 2% of the day, like how can we claim that taking 2% of the day is selfish? It is not selfish. It is essential mm -hmm. completely every single day. Yeah. I love that you came on to share your story. You have so much mm -hmm. advice, wisdom to share, which I really appreciate. Where can people connect with you? Where can they find you? Doula in Reno is everywhere. Doula in Reno.com. Um, also, I have an Instagram called fit curvy 50 plus that I recently started. And that was because I'm now post menopause and post and menopause was the most challenging thing. And that's including seven pregnancies and infertility and all of that. So fit curvy number five, zero plus is an Instagram page. I just started to really in a very uncomfortably, <laughs> uncomfortably for me, raw way, share the fact that menopause absolutely kicked my butt and I decided to kick back um, mm -hmm. so that you can find me there or anywhere at doula in Reno. I love it. I didn't know about your new Instagram page. No. I'm excited to check it out. I'm in the pyramidal puzzle stage of life right now. So here so we are. Fun. So Such fun. A good oh, time. <laughs> and that's one of the biggest things I think with anything with pregnancy, with anything is like if you're preventative medicine, so you're learning about it and doing something before you have to worry about it instead of emergency room, which ended yes. up being me, even though I'm very preventative medicine and I was really trying hard, you know, it ended up being an ER situation. And so learn about stuff earlier so that you have a plan. Absolutely. And I love that there's people like you that are talking about this stuff earlier now, because when I asked my mom, even it was a couple of years ago about perimenopause. And she's like, I mean, I didn't even know that was a thing before I went through menopause. No one talked about the pre 10 years up to leading up to menopause. Like no one talked about that. Oh yeah. I, I just thought I was a crazy person. And I said, oh, just for a decade. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's a lot moving up to it. I think in your thirties and forties, if I retrospect, if I had, if I knew then what I know now, I would have been yeah. doing things before. And mm -hmm. I had lived a very healthy lifestyle mm -hmm. my, since I was 17. So, you know, that's saying something to think that that will combat it and it, it won't necessarily. Yeah, so everything has to change for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to connect with you. Let's do something soon again in the future. Okay. Sounds good. Take care. Go have a great day. You too. Bye.